This thing came out last week, you, you guys saw that, right? DSE results out. And I actually wrote an article, DSE results out. Now what? Okay? Or so what? These people are very happy. What about this guy? How many percent of this kind of people in Hong Kong? Students? 95 percent. Oh, sorry, sorry. This one is 5 percent, right? So what about this guy and his buddies? 95 percent. So we're actually talking to 95 percent here. Okay, we want to make them strong, confident, have high self-esteem, and they want to do well in society, and they can actually do it. Not only the 5%, right? The 5% is 5%, we don't care about them. They're okay. They'll do fine anyway, right? So we're going to look after the 95%. So this is actually you know, what I do here. And now this thing has been around for many weeks now, okay? And I call it model student. Secondary and tertiary. Now, what do you think? Who is a model student? Is it a model students? We don't know, do we? Same thing, you know, it's a big crowd of people, they, you know, happy you know, with the results. So, he could be one day a model citizen. How do you know? Okay. He, he fell in his entrance exam, it's not doing so well, but one day he could be a model student or model citizen. So don't write off anybody in a society. As you step out from HKMU into the society, it's a different ball game. Some are early starters, like a big crowd of people. Some are late starters. I'm one of the late starters, okay? <laughs> All right, so going back to the slide that I had uh, been telling you guys for all these weeks now, the model student I call maybe just a B, B plus, okay? Not, not A, A plus, maybe not, okay? He's multifaceted, okay? Meaning academic, he's pretty okay, he's good in sports, he does some volunteer work, he does arts and culture. Meaning what? Well-rounded, an all-rounded individual, right? Yeah, you knock your legs, you agree with me, right? So this is what I call a model student. Good in every little thing, but not the best in every little thing. We can raise the country. So uh, let's just put our hands together for Natalie. I'm just going to talk about the environmental and other issues you may not be thinking about so important in your life, but they are. So I call her an environmentalist and a naturalist. Nature, I'm sorry, naturist, <laughs> naturist. She goes around your know, different parts of Hong Kong, exploring the countryside of Hong Kong, and she's absolutely fantastic in that area. All right, so Natalie, why don't you just go ahead and tell us what you want to say? Um, hi everyone, so nice to meet you all. I'm Natalie, and as Philip kindly introduced, I, I'm currently working as a sustainability associate at Dairy Farm International, which is a retail group that operates Welcome, IKEA, 7-Eleven, and all these retail stores. So what I do there is related to sustainability, related to how I improve the environment. For example, uh, when you walk into a supermarket, you might look at um, all the all the apples or bananas are wrapped in plastic, right? And then you will feel, oh, why do they need to put them in plastic? So I'm the person who is trying to convince our business leaders to stop using plastics to wrap um, uh, apples and reduce our plastic consumption and all the other metrics like greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so before we start, I'd like to um, briefly like understand and get to know some of you. Um, so these days, it's very, very hot outside. So who do you, th um, like how many of you think it's related to climate change? Can you put up your hand? <laughs> Everybody. Oh, yeah, almost yes. everyone. Yeah. You're correct. So these extreme um, heat waves and uh, extreme weather events are all related to climate change, the climate crisis, we say. And so how many of you are interested to pursue a career in ESG or in sustainability? Anyone? Okay, path, path. Okay, so I'm going to convince some of you to walk into my path sure. through this talk today. What is ESG? What is ESG? Anybody can tell us? Yeah, so just to start, what is ESG? 
I already have the answer here. So E re uh, refers to environmental, and then S is social, G is governance. All listed companies in Hong Kong, um, starting in 2016, they have to submit an ESG report um, on top of their normal financial annual report to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So you can imagine, all companies need to write a report about what they have done on the environmental side, on social side, and on governance side. Environmental is pretty easy um, for us to understand. It's about um, how much energy we use, for example, um, in the office or in some of our retail stores. Whether we are switching on the lights all the time, whether you um, switch them to LED lights, which are more environmentally em uh, energy efficient. Well, for social, um, it includes issues that are very um, hit right now, like diversity and inclusion, DNI. Um, whether your company is hiring uh, people from different background, different ethnicity, um, gender, and sexual orientation. Um, it also relates to health and safety of the employees. Um, for example, some of the factories, if they have very um, dangerous uh, operations, then they need to care about um, the accident rate um, of their staff. And then for governance, it's related to the organizational structure, whether there are issues related to bribery and corruption, and how uh, the senior leaders are organizing and managing the whole company. So um, before I talk about my ESG experience, I'd like to start with my experience in climate education, which is related to what I asked you just now. Um, do you think climate change is important, and what can we do about it as an individual? Uh, uh, so here are four photos. Um, two of them are taken in Hong Kong, and two of them are not. Can you guess which, which two are taken in Hong Kong, which two are not? Any of you like hiking? <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, yes? Make a guess, please, Vicky. <laughs> which, one, which two are in Hong Kong? Um, top right, top left? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, no. <laughs> Only so two, two are now. from Hong Kong, two are from overseas. No, it's oh, oh, not. Uh, top left? Yeah, top left. Okay. Yes. yes, and also, okay. Everyone of them is from Tunu. It's like, um, yeah, 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 Tito. That's in, Noble, right? yeah, that's in Lake Island. And then the top left, you're right. It's from Po Ping Chow, um, near uh, Sai Kong East Dan, uh, the geological uh, hexagonal rock columns. So the reason why I was showcasing these photos is that I want to show to you how valuable and how beautiful is our Hong Kong natural landscape. And a lot of us may not notice it because we don't take the step out to venture uh, to our nature. And this was the reason why I founded an organization that aims to raise awareness around climate education and sustainable tourism in Hong Kong. First of all, why aviation? When we think of climate change, we always think about energy consumption. Um, we look at the lights, we switch off lights, uh, we stop using plastic bottles, we bring our own bottles. Um, but seldom do people relate climate change as an issue with aviation, which is uh, flying abroad, flying to Japan or Taiwan before COVID. And actually, um, our carbon emissions, 25%, uh, one-fourth of them comes from flying overseas uh, before COVID times. And this is why um, I would like to draw people's attention to um, carbon emission and how we can reduce emissions by flying less. Maybe if you're flying to Japan 10, 10 times a year, you can reduce to five times a year. That can already be a significant uh, reduction in your own emissions. So we founded the organization in 2015 with my university friends when I was studying in CUHK. Um, the name is called FAIR. Uh, FAIR is, uh, means green in French, uh, FAIR. And we combine the spelling with air, uh, meaning that we want to explore a green way of traveling. And we are a social enterprise now, uh, hoping to promote climate action and environmental education through sustainable tourism. And this is our mission and vision. We hope to lower carbon emissions per capita, as well as raise people's um, environmental awareness on the natural assets that Hong Kong has to offer. And what we do is bringing people out to the nature um, through experiential learning. We hope to educate the public about how important it is to conserve our environment, and then to enlighten and empower our younger generation to become environmental ambassadors and working in their own ways for sustainability. And these are some of the public and private uh, civil society partners that we have worked with. For example, CHK, um, uh, some of the publishing companies, French Consulate, 
uh, other green groups, and etc. Because we realize a lot of the attraction information are only on Sangake, where they promote um, uh, people going to somewhere to see the red leaves just for one day or two, and then will crowd out the place. And there are also different websites that show hiking trails, but not necessarily other spots such as uh, historical, cultural, arts and culture spaces. So our website also has a filter where you can choose all the arts and culture uh, attractions that you want to visit on the weekend. And in 2017, we have published a book um, called Tai Han Ho Han. Uh, we captured 39 uh, different trails in Hong Kong and how to travel in a responsible way that pr protects the environment. For example, when people go up to uh, have at night, uh, pack night um, in Yin Long, there are seagrass on the land. And why, why are the seagrass important in the carbon cycle? They actually um, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it helps with climate change. So when we travel there, we need to avoid stepping on the seagrass because this will affect um, their function to absorb carbon. So these are some of the tips that we hope to um, uh, educate our readers about. And of course, we organize a lot, lots of um, low carbon eco tours around places like Long Valley, Ma Shi Chao, Long Fu Shan, and some of the green infrastructure. And on youth side, uh, we have our leadership training program every year, and we hire um, secondary and university students to become our interns. And, and to leverage some of the media resources for promotion. And another small experience I'd like to share is um, I'm a member at the Council for Sustainable Development at the Hong Kong government. And some of the events that we have held, um, this is a public forum educating the public about controlling single-use plastic. I guess you have heard of uh, the legislation coming up. Gao plastic bag levy will be raised from 0.5 uh, Hong Kong dollars to one dollar. Yeah. yeah, so you need to pay more when you get an extra plastic bag. And through these uh, public forums, and you can see the image above there, is a school drama that we held. We want to tell the public why are we doing this? Why do we need to ban single-use plastic or control the use through charging a higher cost? And the second part is about my corporate sustainability journey at Dairy Farm. Um, some of the work that I've done uh, is very meaningful and I think it's interesting. For example, we have set up a sustainability framework for the company. You can see, uh, maybe it's too small, but there are three pillars uh, for companies that relate to a retailer. Um, as Philip mentioned, we operate stores like Welcome, 7-Eleven, and IKEA. Um, so, uh, so for instance, we don't own a lot of factories. We only buy uh, products from supplier. This is why we want to focus uh, one of the pillars on sourcing responsibly. We want to source in a way that when we choose suppliers, we need to ensure that the suppliers are not uh, violating some human rights rule. They are not using child labor, they are not using slave or forced labor. And another pillar is sustaining the planet. Because as retailers, we actually contribute a lot to energy consumption. You can see all the Wai Hong uh, Man Lang theme. Um, they always switch on uh, very bright lights. So all these are energy costs and electricity bills. And how are we going to save that? For example, by changing to more climate-friendly refrigerants, by changing the lights to all LED. And these um, all take a lot of planning efforts and strategizing as an ESG professional in the company. And the last pillar is related to the first, the cover photo of our report, that is serving the community. So when you uh, buy rice from Yu Ping King Yu Ban Wo, uh, we actually have a scheme that donates zero point five dollar of every bag of rice uh, to a charity called Food Link Sin Samli, and Food Link will use those money to feed uh, hungry people in Hong Kong. And the reason why we like saw this synergy and partnership is that. Uh, we hope to promote Yu Peng King rice because it is our own brand of rice. And at the same time, we hope to serve the community by contributing a little bit of our profit um, to feed and to help alleviate poverty. So these are some of the ideas that businesses can uh, take lead on to help the society um, as a whole. And another thing I initiated in the company is this in-store food waste recycling. Uh, uh, normal times, uh, when you walk into a welcome store, you see so many different types of products. And of course, some of them might spoil even before they go to customers' bags. Uh, for example, you can see here, there are cabbages and there are some rotten bananas. Maybe they are destroyed during the trans transportation process. And uh, we started to use these food waste bins uh, into our back, back end. 
and starting to collect food waste. And the photo there is how we did a store team member training. Because um, this, although this is very meaningful work, but store members who are working at the cashier, uh, working to stock the shelves, they may not see the meaning behind it, and they just see it as extra work. So um, as a sustainability professional, it is very important to get down to earth your lot day. Because you need to tell those people in their language, why do they have to do some extra work? They don't get paid more um, by separating the food waste. But if they understand the meaning behind it, maybe they will feel a sense of mission and they are proud of um, contributing to the environment. And when we tell them, oh, the food waste will be sent to um, Lantau Island uh, to a factory and turned into renewable energy because the food waste will be um, decomposed with anaerobic digestion and then turned into biogas. So by understanding that what they are doing uh, has a greater value and a mission, then you can encourage people to be more on board with uh, the whole scheme. And the last part of my sharing is how youths, um, how everyone of you here can engage. Um, I guess sustainability is still seen as a more niche area and maybe university, even at CHK, we didn't have a subject called um, sustainability. So I just studied geography. But increasingly, in different companies, in different functions, they need to learn about the concept of environmental conservation. Because of the triple bottom line concept, it is not only about um, saving the world or saving the planet, it is also about your profit. Uh, when we're talking about electricity bills, uh, because of the increase in electricity prices globally, our company is very focused on reducing it, otherwise we will be loss making with all the stores um, using so much electricity and the price is increasing. So um, it has become something that everyone needs to look at. Even for the finance manager, they need to understand how to cut costs from their sustainability initiatives. Um, so I encourage everyone of you, even if you are not studying environmental protection, even if you're studying engineering, you still need to get um, close to the trend up to what is happening in the green building scene. Because now almost all the green, new building have to pass uh, some of the green building assessments. So I, I guess the first step is to understand more because you, you can't care about what you don't know. And th these are some of the resources that I would suggest um, some of you to take a look at if you have free time. And the indefinite or the difficulty increases as we go down. So for instance, for climate change, you can read uh, some simple uh, UK newspaper like The Guardian, Bloomberg Green, The Economist, Carbon Brief. Well, for sustainability and ESG issues, you can uh, read a Hong Kong media called Green Queen. They, I think they're really cool. For example, they have articles on five most eco-friendly products or five best vegan restaurants to go to. So some of the individual actions that I can take. Green Biz um, is a US media that focuses on some of the newest startup concepts. Biz um, is a short firm for business. So basically all the green business ideas that are uh, upcoming and up and running in the world. Eco Business is an Asia Pacific focused news outlet um, started in Singapore and they also have a lot of relevant news for the Asian market. And of course, I mentioned just now, there are lots of green jobs opportunities coming up and by 2030, there are almost uh, 700k green jobs. Um, they can be related to renewable energy, uh, food waste, alternative food, like all the Omi Pog and Impossible Burger. They need the R&D team to help build these vegan food. And you can also take part in uh, international and local environmental networks, such as uh, United Nations Volunteer, SDSN Youth, uh, CCIL, Carbon Care, and OLAB. Um, this is a local Hong Kong NGO. They organize climate youth uh, focus youth training um, for the third year now. And I have also been a mentor on that program. Um, there, there are some university students and young professionals who are keen to understand more about climate change and what they can do on a policy advocacy level. And for me, I chose the path of pursuing a postgraduate program in the environmental field. So you, um, even though your bachelor may not be related to environmental protection, you can do a master's degree in this area because there are loads of options these days. Even at Hong Kong U and CHK, we have quite a few um, like environmental technology masters or environmental management masters that I can look into. And lastly, I'd like to share a concept of donut economics. Um, this lady called Kay Worth, um, she was my lecturer at Oxford and she's also a very famous author who wrote a book called Donut Economics, Tianping Huin Gingzai. 
So when you eat a donut, you can see it's empty inside, right? And then outside is like a ring shape. And she thinks that economy should also be like a donut, where the outer ring means that we do not exceed planetary boundaries. Like, um, even though we develop, we do not um, lead to more climate change or biodiversity loss. While the inner ring means fulfilling social needs, social foundation, which includes reducing hunger, reducing poverty, promoting equality, healthcare, and etc. So we should, if we are able to live in that ring, not to exceed, not to use too much resources, but at the same time fulfill um, all the basic needs and uh, for a thriving life, then we can create a safe and equitable space for our future. And lastly, I'd like to end with a quote by Larry Brilliant from Google Art. He said that change starts with ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and a path to extraordinary is open to anybody at any time. I, I believe any of you sitting here may think that, oh, this climate change is too far, it's too big of an issue. But actually, change only starts with a small step. For example, you can raise awareness about food waste recycling in your canteen at HKMU, or you can brainstorm some of the ideas to encourage people to remember to switch off lights after they use a conference room. So there are so many things that you can do and starting right here, right now, because I also started my organization when I was in first year of university. So hopefully um, all of you can start to take action for our planet's future and for a better community. Thank you very much. I just saw some of you a little bit despair sitting there, you know. Don't. We all belong, most of us belong to the 95%, okay? I'm included. But then you know you can actually catch up. Is it okay, Michelle? We can all catch up. That man going to talk about 10,000 meters. And if you use up all your energy in the first 200 or 2,000, you know, you're going to be what? Fall behind at the end of the trail. Approaching the 10,000 mark. So, we all have the opportunity to catch up and do well in a society. You can do that. Trust me. So, I'm here to encourage every one of us sitting here. You can do that. So, that's the education side of it. Okay, back to Nathan's side. Environmental, nature. Ever since you know we were in Canada, our kids were so little, so small. At high school in Canada, you know what they teach? Separate the garbage, right? You have to separate your garbage. Okay, that's exactly you know what I just showed you. Not only that, separate plastic, bottle, metal, ordinary waste. So we walk out to the yard in Canada, there's four big garbage bins there. Everyone is labeled, right? So we just put things there accordingly. We separate it, you know, for the environment. You separate it from the government in Canada, right? So when they pick up the garbage, they know what to do with it. In Hong Kong, 34 years later, they moved back to Hong Kong. They did the same thing. So every day now, every night, we dump garbage. We just go up and we just put things in the whole bin. So that habit will be with us for the rest of our life. And I cannot just throw a bag of garbage into a, a bin without separating them. It's, it's a habit that we all need to start right now. Right? Is it okay? So this is just to carry on you know, net, Netflix talk and also to carry on our culture. It, it may not be in Hong Kong right now, but that culture will catch on. Anybody separate garbage at home? Anybody does it? You do. Congratulations. <laughs> Eric and David, right? And, and, and Ron Rooney. Perfect. All right. So for those who have not started yet, let's just start. Okay? So. I'm done with my talk today. I think I talked too much already. Um, as I see some of your PowerPoints are about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. This uh, ESG uh, is based on the components of the SDGs. 
Yeah, 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 you can say that. So the UN has 17 SDGs. So basically, some of the SDGs are cross-cutting, but some of them are more related to particular parts of Yashi. For example, 13, climate action, 14, life underwater, and then 15, life on land. They are all more, more related to the E side. And then S side might be related to um, gender equality and uh, reducing hunger, reducing poverty. <coughs> So you can kind of segment it that way. And sometimes when we write corporate um, sustainability report, we also refer to the ESG framework. So I guess in general, in the ESG field, there are many different frameworks that you can follow. So for example, you can have a report that is more focused on specific SDGs. And your, you, um, your company's business might be more relevant to certain SDGs. For example, if you do chemicals or you do pharmaceuticals, then you might have water pollution, you might have sewage, and those sewage uh, will affect marine life. Then you can say your strategic focus is improving SDG 14 and uh, have a series of action on it, like ocean restoration or beach cleaning projects for employees. Uh, yeah, so this is a way to look at it like from different perspectives. What about chief governance? Governance, I guess, is more related to maybe partnerships, uh, SDG 17, and some of the, I guess, like sustainable communities could also uh, yeah, relate to governance. But there's no like strict rules on which one is E, which one is S, which one is G, because SDGs are meant to be interconnected, and some of them may also have trade-offs, so it, you need to be very careful when applying the framework on reports and on uh, strategizing around the company. Any other questions? One more question. Okay, maybe East Carol. So, um, a company's primary purpose is to earn profit. So, well, why do you do you this? Huh? Sitting behind you, can oh, make a question. Well, um, thank you for your presentation. I think it's really cool that a woman is working in this industry. So, for me, you're kind of like a role model. But my question is um, so, a company's main purpose is to make profit. So as someone who works in ESG, don't you think there's like a conflict of interest and do you think that companies are doing enough uh, in terms of ESG and being responsible for their, all the emissions they put out and all the pollution and everything else? Yeah, I think this is a great question, thank you. Um, so in the past, people see ESG as an externality. It's something that's not related to their business and it will definitely harm their business. But in recent years, we're starting to see a change in the mindset. For, for instance, my example just now of switching all lights to LED, initially it's, it's an investment, but the return on investment can be like one year or two years. So after a year, we're seeing more savings from the electricity bills because we changed to a more energy efficient light, and then that a saving can actually cover the initial investment. So for this one, you can communicate communicate with uh, the finance people, why should we do it? Because for the long term, it's beneficial for the company. And another way of seeing it is investors are increasingly aware of ESG and of environmental issues generated by companies. So uh, for now, there are lots of ESG funds, green finance, if you, um, you can uh, search more about it, where the companies and investors start to stop investing in companies if they don't have a robust environmental plan for the future. Um, so if you don't care about ESG, you will lose money for investors, then the company cannot keep operating. Even for dairy farms, we are facing investors pressure externally because they tell us, oh, you need to set your net zero target, you need to set your carbon reduction target, otherwise uh, we will not lend money to you anymore. So uh, you can see like more influence from different sectors of government regulation, investors pressure, all these forces pushing the sustainability agenda. So I think it's definitely a thriving field um, that you can consider um, studying more and understanding more. Yes, yeah, that's right.